And as all of you are coming and having a seat, I want to welcome you and have invite you to enjoy with me a wonderful Resurrection Sunday morning celebration here. Thank you for coming. If you're visiting with us, there's a part of your bulletin that if you will, you just tear that off and fill it out with your name, address, any other information you might want to put on there. And when you're finished with that, simply fold it in half and at the back of the sanctuary as well as up here, there are offering plates that you're welcome to place that little visitor's information in. And I'd love to be able to get back with you if you'll call me or I'll call you. I'd love to talk with you if you have any questions about the church or about what you might hear today. I'd love to have you do that for us. Also, many of you are involved in what we call a church-wide Bible study. We're studying the book of Daniel. And if you're interested in doing that, we're doing the second part of that study beginning next Sunday. I'll preach on Daniel chapter 6, and we have small groups that meet throughout the week that talk about what we talked about Sunday. And so if you're interested in that, my number is here in the bulletin. Take the bulletin home. Say, you know, I want to learn about that book of Daniel. There are still opportunities for you to come and join us if you'd like. So I invite you to call me this week if you have questions about that Daniel study. As Pastor Dave comes forward, I just want to alert you as well that this Wacky Wednesday offering, and there's too much time to take to explain it, but this is our last one for this school year, April 17th here from 6 to 7.30. So please, if you have any questions about that, call me. Our youth pastor, Dave, has an announcement. Good morning. Did you see the spark from the shock there? I know it's like it's every Sunday, but that one really just kept going. You just got to keep on pressing through. So yes, uh, no youth group tonight, but we are having a youth group next Sunday night over at the youth building. So if anybody wants to join us for that, or if you're just wanting to check us out, the third Sunday of next month, we are having our CAC Sunday, which from three to five, we're going to be over at the CAC. We'll have pizza, bowling, games, and everything else for the teens there. And of course, as Kurt mentioned, Wacky Wednesday is always a really fun time. We go over at the gym. Uh, I love playing kickball with the kids. It's a lot of fun. And, um, you know, they go easy on me. So, um, you know, it's just a great time. And there's food for the parents. And it's just a great time just to kind of unwind a little bit uh, and just let your kids have a great time and learn about the Lord. So we got kids stuff. We got teen stuff coming up. And uh, we look forward to seeing you very soon. Thank you, Dave. Let's continue to worship by bowing our heads and let's call on the Lord and invite him to remind us of why we're here today. Lord Jesus, your presence is not to be entered into lightly. We're not simply to think that you're the man upstairs and that we can uh, flippantly call on you whenever it's convenient or inconvenient for us. But our desire today is to put you first and to make sure in our soul that you're at the center of our lives, not just at the fringe somewhere. And we pray that you'll remind us today of the power of your rising from the dead, that no other religious leader in any other major religion of the world ever claimed to have power over death and prove it by rising like you did. And you are worthy of our worship. And you're worthy of our commitment. And you're worthy of our loyalty and our love. And may you stir our hearts this morning to give you the worship that you deserve, to give you the place that you not only deserve but desire in our soul. That place of primacy, first place, not a hobby, but first place, where you impact every area of our lives. May you remind us that your resurrection from the death demands no less. You are King and Lord, even over death. Cause us then to worship you today in spirit and in truth. In your name we pray. Amen. Will you stand together with me and let's sing the first hymn, The Day of Resurrection.
may be seated. Our joy that has no end. There's a couple of uh, passages I want to read for you this morning, and the first one is from the Old Testament book of Isaiah. Many of you know that Isaiah was called a prophet. He lived about 700 years before Christ was even born. And I want you to note what he speaks of in these three verses hundreds of years before Christ is even born. And I'll touch on this passage a little bit more in the message in a few minutes. Isaiah 25, 6 through 9. On this mountain, and the mountain Isaiah was referring to was the mountain which the city of Jerusalem would be built, on which it is built. On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats and the finest of wines, not literally, but figuratively. And on this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. And what is that shroud? What is that sheet? Verse 8, he will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces, and he will remove the disgrace of his people from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. And in that day they will say, surely this is our God. We trusted in him and he saved us. This is the Lord. We trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his, the one who would destroy death forever, in his salvation. The second reading is from the New Testament book of 1 Corinthians. Paul writes to Christians in the city of Corinth, which we know is a city in Greece even today, city of Corinth. And he writes this in chapter 15, beginning in verse 12. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. And if only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own turn, Christ the first fruits, and then when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. And he has put that enemy under his feet by rising from the dead. Let's pray again. Lord, we are certainly... uh, a congregation today with many challenges that each of us face, many trials that each of us know we have to go through, many twists and turns that we'd rather not go through, and we wonder if you're so good and loving, why you would allow us to go through difficult moments and times of trial and struggle. I pray that today you would remind us of this simple fact that you have proven your goodness once and for all by sending your son to die on the cross. If you didn't care about us, if you didn't love us, that would have never happened. And then you didn't leave him, but you raised him from the death, from dead, validating 
his perfect sinless life that death could have no hold over him because it had no legal claim on him. There was no sin in him, and you were pleased to raise him from the dead. Father, may we never doubt your goodness to us, even in this world. Cause us now to sing to you, worship you, love you. Change our hearts about you, Lord Jesus. In your name, amen. Good morning. Please stand up and join us as we celebrate his resurrection today.
And if you have uh, children, age four through grade four, they're welcome to go downstairs where we have what we call a children's church program. We've got a teacher who can help them understand what this message is I'm about to bring. And also, if you have uh, an infant up to age two, we have an infant nursery that's well-staffed. And if you're a little uncertain about that, you can always watch the live stream that's on the TV downstairs. But we want you to know we've got those two options available for you if you're a parent with a child. And we'd love to have you go ahead and, maybe not today, but someday in the future, take advantage of those opportunities. Children's Church. And I'm going to have you open in your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 28, where we read about this most momentous event. There is no greater event in human history. And if you doubt that, I just want to throw you back to that Old Testament Isaiah passage, the shroud that covers all people. This affects everyone. This issue of death is a reality. And there is only one who has defeated death. And we read about him in Matthew chapter 28. You can follow along as I read chapter 28, the first verse. After the Sabbath, that is after Saturday, the Jewish Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, that's Sunday, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and, going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you're looking for Jesus who is crucified. He is not here. He has risen just as he said. And I want you to remember those four words for the rest of the morning. Just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you in Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid, yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly, Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. And they came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. And then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. Just as he said. I want to pray for a moment, and then we'll start. Jesus, remind us that you alone, being God, come in the flesh, have power, the power to give life, to create life, and the power over death. And we worship you today, that there is no other who could ever not only make that claim, but back it up. And while we don't have time to explore the options other than your rising from the dead, which can easily be disproven, there is no other logical conclusion than that you truly rose from the dead, defeating death, leaving an empty tomb for all to see. That if somehow the disciples were playing games and hiding your body, they wouldn't have died for that. Or that if they had somehow taken it and the religious leaders found it, they could have simply paraded your body through the streets, but they never did. Your tomb is empty. Unlike that of Lenin in Russia or even Muhammad in Medina, that you, Jesus, leave an empty tomb. And with us, you have caused us to be challenged with that truth. And yet it is, just as you said. Help us to see that this is what you repeated time after time throughout the Word, your Word, the Bible. And help us to see that this is the very apex of what you came to do, to pay for sin and to conquer death itself, the shroud that covers everybody. We all need to know your power to grant eternal life. 
Lord, will you give us insight into your word, the Bible? May we trust what you have said, because your resurrection is truly just as you said it would be. In your name, amen. Today uh, is, would be my dad's uh, 90th birthday. He's not around to celebrate it, but I remember about 50 years ago, I think it was pretty much 50 years ago, this Easter, we traveled to a little town called Lyons, New York. It was my dad's uh, birthplace. And we chose to go to church on Easter Sunday at this little church. And I'll never forget driving home. I was, you know, a kid, but I understood. And my dad kept saying, the pastor said, we don't know what happened. We don't know what happened. We don't know what happened. And my dad left that service thinking, why didn't he know what happened? Christ conquered death. Why didn't he know? Why couldn't he tell us? Instead, he simply repeated the phrase, we don't know what happened. Well, Jesus conquered death by rising from the dead. And he told us time after time, just as he said, like the angel told the people who saw the empty tomb, it's just as he said, it's no surprise. It's no plan B. It's just as he always said that he would rise and defeat death. You know, the resurrection is a reality for many reasons, but the biggest is that he himself had predicted and promised it. And I hope that today as you look in these scriptures with me, you'll see not just something that 12 disciples cooked up, as some in our culture might hint, or that it's some religious thing and every religion is the same. That's not true. There's only one leader who ever claimed to have power over death and rose to prove it, and that's Jesus. The Messiah, which means Christ, or the Anointed One, the Chosen One. So I want to look with you and see where it is, just as he said. And the first place I want to have you turn, if you have your Bible, is Psalm 1610. This is in the Old Testament. And you might say, well, how did Jesus get involved with the Old Testament? In Revelation 1910, John, one of Jesus' disciples, says that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. In other words, whatever was written in the Old Testament, because Jesus is God, his spirit authored that Old Testament. And so whatever Jesus is saying that the angel said, just as he said, we can include the Old Testament prophecies that Jesus' spirit inspired, according to Revelation 19.10. So what did the Holy Spirit say regarding his rising from the dead in the Old Testament? Psalm 16.10 David says, you will not let your Holy One see decay. So David's writing a thousand years before Christ. And he's saying that you will not let your Holy One see decay. Could David, who was David talking about? And people might say, well, he was talking about himself. But David's tomb can still be visited today. So David is still in the grave. And the Holy One that he's speaking about is someone other than himself. It must be the Holy One of God, whom the Bible refers to often as the coming Messiah, or in Greek, Christos, where we get Christ. So Jesus Christ, Christ isn't his last name, it's his title. It's who he is, the Holy One of God, the Chosen One of God, the Anointed One of God. And this Holy One, David writes, you will not let his body see decay. The earth could not hold him. Death didn't own him because he is God, come in the flesh. Holy, that word means separate, unique, set aside, one of a kind. No one ever lived a life like Jesus did without sin, free from accusation, always doing the will of God the Father. And David wrote in Psalm 16, verse 10, you will not let your Holy One See decay. Now turn with me to Isaiah chapter 25, because this is a fascinating passage written by the prophet Isaiah about 700 years before Christ was born. And you have to know a little bit about the mountain, because this mountain that Isaiah is referring to is about the story of Abraham when God says, Take your son, your one and only son, and take him up onto this mountain, the mountains of Moriah. And there, sacrifice your son. But before 
he could sacrifice his son, God sent a substitute, but it was a ram, and God promised on this mountain, I will provide in the future a lamb. So the ram wasn't God's provision. The lamb who is to come is Jesus, the lamb of God. And on that mountain, Jesus would go and die on a cross. And on that mountain, he would be buried nearby, and his tomb would be empty because he conquered the grave. On that mountain then, let's read it again, verse 6. The Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, not just for his own people, the Jews. A banquet of aged wine, the best of meats, and the finest of wines. On this mountain, here's the work he'll do to supply that party. He will destroy the shroud that enfolds all people. Everyone deals with this issue. The sheet that covers all nations. And what is that? He will swallow up death forever. On that mountain. Exactly as he said 700 years before. On that mountain, he would swallow up death forever, leaving an empty tomb in his wake. And finally, another passage from Isaiah, chapter 53, a remarkable prophecy of the suffering of Jesus in detail, telling about how his clothes would be uh, torn in, in, in parts and how his feet would be pierced and all kinds of detail about Jesus' crucifixion, but I want to focus especially on verses 10 and 11 of chapter 53. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him. It was God's will to send his son to the cross. It was his design, and even to cause him to suffer. And though the Lord, God Almighty, makes his life the life of the servant, even though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. And after the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. And by his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many. He will bear their iniquity. So every Jewish person knew that if you brought a sacrifice, it had to die. But after this death, Isaiah is saying, he will see the light of life. And his days will be prolonged after his death, after his offering of himself for sin. To those who say, we don't know what happened. We don't know what happened that first Easter. The Bible says he is risen just as he said. And he, throughout the whole Old Testament, is painting a picture of how he would have to suffer and take my punishment for sin, to take the sin that you can't pay for. Now, sometimes we think, well, I can do a good job. I, I'm a pretty good person. I can cover my tracks pretty well. Well, the problem is, if I do my best from today onward, what about the sin I committed 40 years ago? That's still there. I can't atone for that. No one can make up for their own sin. Jesus had to do that. And then he proved that he was a worthy sacrifice by being raised from the dead. Let me take 10 seconds to highlight why. If Jesus had sinned, if he was not God, if he had come and he made one mistake, legally, death would have had a hold of him. Death would have had a legal right to hold him in that grave. But the Father was pleased to raise Jesus from the grave. Why? Because sin had no legal right on him. He never sinned. And that's why his sacrifice is so unique, his death on the cross, so special, so significant. Just as he said through the Holy Spirit. So when he rose, that was God the Father's stamp of approval on his son's perfect life, saying, this is the one who did everything according to my will. Just as he said in the Old Testament. Just as he said, he did everything he said. And I want to take you now to the New Testament because it was just as he said to his doubters, to people who doubted who he was. Jesus proved over and over again that he was the one and that he would die on the third day, uh, rise again. So let's take a look at John chapter 2. If you've got your Bibles, John is 
one of Jesus' closest disciples. And he's writing here in chapter 2, near the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And people were saying, you know, we want to see another sign. You turned water into wine earlier in the chapter. Now we want to see something more to prove that you're the guy. Tell us how you can prove you're our Messiah. And in verses 18 through 22, Jesus does that. And he says this, When the Jews demanded of him, what miraculous sign can you show to prove us your authority to do this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. The Jews replied, It's taken 46 years to build this temple. That was Herod's temple, an actual temple in Jerusalem. It's taken 46 years to build this temple, and you are going to raise it in three days? His doubters asked, John explains, but the temple he had spoken of was his body. Jesus wasn't speaking about the physical temple in Jerusalem. He was speaking of his body. And although they misunderstood what Jesus was saying, Jesus was beginning right at the very start of his ministry to point ahead, saying, it's just like I told you, just like I said at the very beginning. They misunderstood but he knew exactly what he would do. And John, writing afterwards, said, we get it now. This is what he wanted people to know. Now his doubters began to understand a little further what he meant because at the trial, just before the cross, Jesus, who faced Caiaphas the high priest in Matthew chapter 26, was giving again the same information as he always gave I'm going to rise on the third day. Take a look at verses 59 through 61. So he's before the religious high priest, before the religious people, they were doubting him, doubted that he was their Messiah. He didn't fit the mold. He didn't fit their plan. And in chapter 26 of the book of Matthew, beginning in verse 59, here's what takes place. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin, that's the Jewish religious people, the leadership, were looking for false evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death. But they did not find any, though many false witnesses came forward. Finally, two came forward and declared, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. And his doubters accused him again, saying, He claimed that he would destroy this temple, and then raise it again after three days. So Jesus spoke that at the beginning of his ministry, and the people who were doubters said, hey, we remember him saying such a thing, that he was going to destroy this temple. All the other witnesses before that were false, but these two were not said to be false. They just didn't understand what he was saying. But they weren't false. The other false witnesses were in the verse before, where they brought false accusations before these religious leaders, and they didn't stick. But these accusations weren't false. Jesus had claimed that if you destroyed his temple, his body, he would raise it again after three days. Just as he said. Just as he said. Even to his doubters. Even to the high priest. The highest religious authority. Sometimes people say, well, I'm religious, Kurt. I don't need this Jesus stuff you're bringing today. Even the religious people didn't understand that Jesus had said prior, I've got to die in your place, no matter how religious you are. There was a man who came to him at night named Nicodemus. He was a religious man. And Jesus said, look, all the religion you're doing, all the outward stuff you're doing, all the church attendance, all the praying, all the good deeds, he said to Nicodemus, you've got to be born again. I've got to live in you in such a way as your whole life has to restart. You've got to have a new perspective, a new way of living. And that way is by Christ and living by his command, under his control. Nicodemus didn't understand at first, but he was one of those who at Jesus' death said, I'll take his body. We'll take care of it. You can show no greater loyalty than to say, I'll take care of that dead person's body. Jesus said to his doubters, I will destroy this temple or let it be destroyed and then after three days I will raise it. Finally, in Matthew 27, just another page over, 
his doubters began to understand that he wasn't talking about the physical temple anymore when he made that claim. But in chapter 27, verse 62 through 66, listen to what was said after his death. They wanted to make his tomb secure. And listen to the conversation in chapter 27 of Matthew, verse 62 and following. The next day, the one after preparation day, that is Saturday, the Sabbath, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, so Pilate's the judge, he's the Roman judge, and the religious people come to the Roman judge and say, Sir, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver, Jesus, deceiving everybody, said, after three days, I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he's been raised from the dead. And this last deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go, make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard. So even after a time, even his doubters began to realize he wasn't talking about the temple. He was claiming that he himself would rise from the dead. And they said, in order to stop that from happening, let's make sure the tomb is secure. Post a guard. Put the Roman seal of, it, of, of the governor onto that tomb, onto that stone rolled in front of the tomb. Make sure nobody comes to steal that body. But he rose, just as he said. No matter his doubters trying to keep him from rising, it happened, just as he said, because God caused an earthquake. The soldiers fell over like dead men, and Jesus rose from the dead, just as he said. Even to his doubters, it happened, despite their trying to stop it, just as he said. Finally, it was just as he said to his disciples, And I want to take you to Matthew chapter 16. Jesus had been speaking about his work to the crowds in general, but now he begins to speak specifically to his disciples. And his first topic to be discussed with them is this resurrection from the dead. Verse 21, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed, and on the third day be raised to life. He began to prepare his own disciples to hear this truth, but they didn't understand. It was so foreign to them, because they expected something to happen in this life that would benefit them now. And this is the mistake that many Americans make. When they take Jesus to be their Savior, they think he wants to smooth everything out now and give me a great life now where I don't have any problems now. And somehow, in our twisted thinking, we think his kingdom should be about now rather than for eternity. And people say, well, I'm a Christian, but why am I going through this trial, this struggle, this ordeal? That's because they haven't heard what Jesus is saying. I didn't come to be a literal king and let you be my second in charge and have it your way so that you have all the praise and accolades in Jerusalem now. I've come to give you freedom from sin and its hold on you. And I've come to rise from the dead and conquer death so that you can know that when I promise to give you eternal life, I will give you eternal life. Just as he said, it would happen. And yet, they discounted it. They didn't understand it. And in our culture, we don't get it either. We think, well, Easter's come and gone again. Raised from the dead, ho-hum, big deal. What's What's the deal? Nobody has ever conquered death. It was a shroud that covers every nation for all time and all history. Nobody ever conquered death but him. It was just as he said. Take a look at Mark chapter 9. Many of you are familiar with the story of the transfiguration. That's when Jesus took three of his disciples. He went to the top of a mountain, and supernaturally, he was changed from simply his human form to a form where he was brilliantly displayed 
And they saw his holiness, and they saw the glory of God on that mountain. I don't have time to go into that story, but that was just a little bit uh, before what I'm going to read now. But as they were coming down from that mountain, listen to the conversation. They'd just seen the glory of God displayed in Jesus. Jesus was proving that he was more than a man, that he was God come in the flesh. And after six days, I'm going to just bump down here to verse 9. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they'd seen, what they'd witnessed, until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. Now listen to verse 10. They kept the matter to themselves, discussing what rising from the dead meant. You see, this was central to Jesus' coming. He didn't just come to be a good moral teacher. He didn't just come to be a good example of what mankind should do to each other. Jesus came to pay the price for my sin. And he came to conquer death by rising from the dead. He didn't come just to be a good guy. He didn't come just to present a different way among many. He is the way. He is the truth. And he is the life. And he proved it just as he said. Just as he said. Finally, the last passage, one you're very familiar with, John chapter 11, where Jesus' friend Lazarus had died. And Jesus had heard of his sickness before his death. And Jesus delayed his coming. And Lazarus, in fact, did die. But now, here in chapter 11, his sister Martha comes to Jesus saying, if you'd been here, he wouldn't have died. And listen to the conversation Jesus has with Martha, Lazarus' sister. Beginning in verse 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. And the last question is an important one. Do you believe this? Do you believe this today? Jesus is saying, I am the resurrection, Martha. Don't just believe in a general, oh, everybody's going to rise again someday. Jesus is saying, I am that resurrection. I am that eternal life. I am the one who's going to conquer death and will raise you who believe. And he asked her, do you believe this? And that's the question I want to leave with you for the rest of the day. Do you believe this? Or is this just one of many religious facts that is floating around in our heads? Where we just say, oh, that's the religious stuff I learned. Or do you know that he has power over death for you? power to grant eternal life to you, not just a religious fact you've got stuck up in your head, but yours, guaranteeing your resurrection from the dead. Just as he said, I am the resurrection. I am the life. You know, people say to me all the time, I've done many funerals, and people say, oh, death is just a natural part of life, and they think they're so philosophical and wise, but the biblical fact is, death is not a natural part of life. Death is called an enemy. Remember that passage in 1 Corinthians. The last enemy to be put under his feet is death. Why is death an enemy? Because I sinned. And I have stiff-armed God. And I have said to God, oh, you're just one of those things I can pay attention to later. Or maybe he becomes like a hobby where I get excited about him for a time and then I put him down and other things excite me. And I think, oh, he's just like one of those things. But God, long ago, took me out of my ignorance. And I'm so grateful for his patience. And if you're here today and you're saying, you know, it's been a long time. If I do this, I'm going to look like a fool. I'm not going to be myself. Nobody's going to want to be near me. I'll have no friends. The only friend you really want is God Almighty. You want to be united to the one who created you. And the only way to do that is to put your trust in Jesus. Many people say, well, I, I know that, but whom are you trusting? If I asked you, how, 
do you expect to get into heaven? You might say, well, I'm a good person. I go to church. I pray every day. I even read some of the Bible. I help people. I give money to the church. I'm a good person. I, I haven't killed anybody yet, you know. But listen to whom you're trusting. Listen. I'm going to church. I'm a good person. I pray every day. I haven't killed anybody. You're trusting your own performance. To believe in Jesus means to transfer your trust from your goodness to his perfect sinless life. When you've done that, the Bible says you'll be moved from death to life. There are many disciples and doubters of Jesus who didn't listen at first. But he had risen, just as he said. Will you believe today, just as he said, that he can be your Savior, that his death on the cross does pay for your sin, and that by believing, you can have eternal life? He is risen, just as he said. No mistake, no plan B. It was always supposed to be that way. Let's bow in prayer. Lord, I pray that if there is anyone here, and we've all been there, there's not a one of us who was born religious. There's not a one of us who have always known you. There's not a one of us who's always been a Christian, but we all had to come to a place where we realized, I've been trusting in myself. I've been trusting in my own goodness. I've been comparing myself to Joe down the street rather than God in heaven. And Father, my prayer is that you would show us clearly this morning that when we compare ourselves and our righteousness to you in heaven, we fall far short. And there's only one who can bridge that gap, and that's your son Jesus, who never sinned, whom you prove to be righteous and holy through and through by raising him from the dead just as you had promised. Father, if there's anyone here today that needs to make that first decision, remind them that this is not the end. This is not the end to their friendship with you, just the beginning. Help them not to think they can have their ticket to heaven and walk out of these doors living the same way they always lived. Help them to know that your resurrection life will change them and will cause them to know you causing them to love you and obey you. Father, may you do your work today. May you bring people into your kingdom in your timing for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and let's sing again the final hymn.
victory, never to be undone. The promise to you and I who believe in him, never to be withdrawn, but always extended. I hope that as you walk out today, if you have any questions, you'll, you'll take your bulletin home, you'll call me, you'll say, you know, Kurt, you're just pretty confusing. Help me understand. And that, I, I'd love to talk with you, I really would. And know that there is no one that he died for more than you. Nobody better. We're all sinners and we all needed him. Now, as we leave, there's a, um, a traditional saying, and I'd like you to, if, in a moment, once I say, he is risen, to respond back to me, he is risen indeed. So, on this Easter resurrection morning, he is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. At the Easter. Amen.